Have you ever wondered how nuclear bombs actually work? First off, I want to start by saying that nothing in this video that I'll be covering is classified, so don't worry, you're not going to put on some kind of watch list. Nuclear weapon is a blanket term used for a number of different types of bombs that all utilize nuclear reactions to produce massive amounts of energy, like how conventional explosives utilize chemical reactions. Because people comment this a lot, I feel the need to add that nuclear bomb, atomic bomb, and A-bomb are all just names for the same thing and are not different types of bombs. I have no idea why people keep arguing they are different. The two main types of nuclear bomb are fission and fusion. Fission bombs, like the name suggests, primarily generate their explosive energy from the fission reactions of uranium-235 or plutonium-239. Fusion bombs, or thermonuclear bombs, generate most of their explosive energy from the fusion reactions of the hydrogen isotopes deuterium and tritium. Modern hydrogen bombs use lithium deuteride, but more on that later. There are also subclasses of nuclear bomb that operate more or less the same way, but with different effects, such as neutron bombs and salted bombs. Fission During the Manhattan Project, scientists knew theoretically what needed to happen to build a bomb using fission, but were not sure mechanically how to do it exactly. To get the bomb to work, they knew they needed to take subcritical masses of a suitable fission material and very quickly make it go critical. A number of concepts were drawn up, but in the end, two methods were chosen. The gun type and the implosion type. Gun type The gun type nuclear bomb is the simplest design. The little boy bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Japan, was a gun type. Seen as foolproof, this design was not tested first, making little boy the first detonation of a gun type design. Running the length of the bomb was a long tube or gun barrel. At one end was a narrow cylinder made up of six stacked uranium-235 discs. Behind the discs was a tungsten carbide tamper and a steel plate, with more tungsten carbide around the end of the barrel. Polonium beryllium neutron initiators surrounded the uranium cylinder. At the other end was a larger cylinder of uranium-235 made of nine stacked discs with a hole in the middle that fit over the narrow cylinder. Behind it was a tungsten carbide disc and a steel plug, sitting in front of the cordite explosives. When the bomb was detonated, the explosives would propel the larger uranium cylinder over the smaller one at very high speeds. The two uranium pieces would form a supercritical mass, now completely surrounded by the tungsten carbide acting as a neutron reflector. The neutron initiators, activated by the force of the uranium crushing the polonium and beryllium together, would add a burst of neutrons into the uranium mass. In a fraction of a second, runaway fission reactions would, would occur, producing massive amounts of energy. Gun-type bombs are not very efficient. Out of the 64 kilograms of uranium in the Little Boy bomb, only a little under 1 kilogram was converted to energy in the reaction. This was still enough to produce an explosion with a force of 15,000 tons of TNT. A gun-type bomb using plutonium was designed. Known as Thin Man, it would have been more powerful than Little Boy, but far simpler than the Fat Man implosion bomb design. However, due to impurities of plutonium-240, which had a high rate of spontaneous fission, the Thin Man would not have been a very reliable bomb, probably blowing itself apart too quickly for the supercritical reaction needed. The bomb would have needed to be unreasonably long to work, and therefore it was scrapped. Implosion Type Implosion-type bombs are way more complicated than the gun types, but use similar steps to operate. In an implosion bomb, a sphere of nickel-plated plutonium-gallium alloy known as the pit, with a small polonium-beryllium sphere in the middle, is surrounded by another sphere of uranium-238, which acts as a tamper, with a boron plastic shell on the outside. This in turn is surrounded by an aluminum pusher sphere, which itself is surrounded by a layer of fast explosives comprised of compound B, 60% RDX and 40% TNT. Around the compound B are cone-shaped charges of a slower explosive, baryton, made of 70% barium nitrate and 30% TNT, with more compound B surrounding the whole thing in an icosahedron geometry. Exploding bridge wire detonators are attached to each explosive section with brass sleeves. When the detonators are fired simultaneously, it starts an explosive shockwave that changes the geometry as it passes through the detonating baryton. The shockwaves all converge and take on a spherical implosion wave that is amplified by the inner explosive layer. The implosion wave crushes the aluminum sphere, transferring the shockwave through the boron plastic shell into the uranium and plutonium spheres. The beryllium polonium sphere at the heart of the pit is crushed, producing a burst of neutrons. Fission reactions start in the plutonium pit, the inward compression from the uranium tamper on the plutonium keeping it together and reflecting neutrons as the mass goes supercritical. The uranium tamper also undergoes fission and is responsible for up to 20% of the bomb's explosive force. 
Around 1 kg of the 6 kg of plutonium undergo fission, more efficient than gun-type bomb and producing an explosive force of 21,000 tons of TNT. An implosion-type bomb was the first nuclear bomb tested under the codename Trinity. The same design, named Fat Man, was later used on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. Thermonuclear Bombs Almost immediately following the development of the atomic bomb, there was an idea to use the fission reaction to generate a much more powerful fusion reaction. The first experiments with this concept was known as boosting, where fusion fuel, usually gaseous deuterium and tritium, was added to the center of the plutonium pit or in a space around the pit. In the Soviet Union, a bomb design known in English as layer cake used alternating layers of the fission materials uranium-238 and 235 and fusion fuel, in this case lithium-6 deuteride, to boost the bomb's yield up to 400 kilotons, or 400,000 tons of TNT. This bomb was flawed in that it required a lot more conventional explosives and was not scalable to arbitrary sizes like other designs. With boosting, most of the energy was still from the fission reaction, meaning it's not a true thermonuclear bomb, just a fusion-enhanced fission bomb. Boosting also allows bombs to have a variable yield, or dial a yield. By simply changing the amount of fusion fuel added to the bomb, the yield can be adjusted. The first true full-scale hydrogen bomb was the American Ivy Mike test, Using a staged Teller Ulam design, the first bomb used liquid deuterium as the fusion fuel and produced a yield of 10 megatons, or 10 million tons of TNT. Teller Ulam The Teller Ulam design is in principle just a staged nuclear device, with a conventional implosion fission device primary and a fusion secondary. Different methods exist for the operation, but the designs are all roughly the same. Radiation pressure from X-rays generated by the fission first stage can directly compress the fusion secondary, however there are other approaches aimed at improving this reaction. Foam Plasma In a foam plasma device, the fusion secondary is a uranium-238 tamper filled with lithium-6 deuteride and a hollow plutonium rod down the center. Around the secondary assembly is polystyrene foam. When the fission primary detonates, the X-rays produced convert the foam into a superheated plasma that compresses the fusion secondary. The plutonium rod in the center, known as the spark plug, starts to fission. At this point, the neutron flux from both the fission first stage and plutonium spark plug caused the lithium and the lithium-6 deuteride to produce tritium, which under the intense compression of the secondary stage starts to fuse with the deuterium. The uranium tamper also starts to undergo fission at this point, adding to the energy release. Tamper Pusher Ablation This bomb is largely the same, but instead of using plasma pressure, the tamper itself starts to ablate from the intense X-ray flux, and in doing so, rapidly compresses the secondary, starting a fission reaction in the spark plug, which catalyzes the fusion reaction in the lithium-6 deuteride. Three-stage hydrogen bombs can also be built that have two fusion stages. The Soviet Tsar Bomba, the largest nuclear weapon ever detonated, is thought to have been a three-stage bomb. Making things worse for everyone in the world of nuclear bomb design, there is only one real objective, make your bomb worse than your opponents. This led to a few rather disturbing designs. Neutron Bomb A neutron bomb is what's known as an enhanced radiation weapon. What sets it apart from other nuclear bombs is the blast yield is intentionally kept as low as possible. The casing of the bomb is designed to be transparent to neutrons or made of a material that intentionally generates even more neutron radiation. In effect, the bomb would have a smaller physical blast yield, but a much more powerful radiation pulse. This bomb was designed specifically to irradiate populations, where a conventional nuclear bomb is designed to physically destroy infrastructure. A number of countries developed, built, and tested neutron bombs, but their status is less clear now as no country is known to have neutron bombs deployed as a part of their deterrence. Any dial yield bomb with a setting below 10 kilotons, however, potentially can be used as a neutron bomb. Salted Bombs Salted bombs are another, rather disturbing concept for a nuclear weapon. It is a bomb designed to produce far more radioactive fallout than a conventional bomb, rendering entire areas lifeless for a very long time. The basic construction is that of a normal fission or fusion weapon, but with an added metal that will absorb neutrons and produce highly radioactive byproducts. The most commonly cited example is cobalt, where cobalt-59 is converted to the highly radioactive isotope cobalt-60. Other metals proposed have been gold, tantalum, zinc, and sodium. Although small-scale tests have been conducted, as far as I know, no one has salted bombs in their nuclear arsenals, as they are kind of pointless unless you are at or beyond the level of a comic book Marvel villain. 
Although the general mechanics of nuclear weapon construction and operation seem disturbingly simple, obtaining the fission material is extremely difficult and time-consuming. These weapons are interesting from a technical standpoint and can be seen as the pinnacle of human military power, but as long as we point them at one another, they are also a sword hanging over our heads. To date, Little Boy and Fat Man are the only nuclear weapons ever used in a war. We owe it to the memory of the lives they claimed and the common spirit of humanity that we never see these devices used against people in an act of malice ever again.